Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the workshop. This is a an episode that I've been waiting to make for quite some time. It's called History Lesson. Uh, and what this is really about is going to kind of give you a look inside my head uh, when it comes to theming my guitars and, and how that happens. Uh, plus, you're going to get a look at some other interests. So, this one will cover uh, planes and trains and... Just history, there's going to be some talk about a plane crash in here. Uh, and this is a uh, guitar themed after all that. So uh, there's going to be a little bit of guitar building here and theming. But outside of that, if you don't care about history or this other stuff, uh, click off now and maybe catch my next video. I always forget to film the housekeeping section. Uh, and so let's get that out of the way now. At the end of the video, you'll see my email address up on the top. I get emails from you. I like that. Um, in the center, there will be a round emblem. Uh, click that to subscribe to my channel. That way you just automatically get noticed when I release a video. And then on either side is my playlist or a video that uh, the YouTube algorithm, which is way smarter than me, I guess, figures out what you want to watch based on your viewing patterns. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. But anyway, housekeeping out of the way, uh, let's go on. But before we get too deep into this, uh, a little bit about theming. I think I'm going to do a future episode about theming and get into the details of it. But here's the bottom line on theming. If you are trying to get a guitar in an artist's hands or make a one-of-a-kind guitar that you're going to uh, uh, sell to someone, the best thing to do is do a little bit of research and make the guitar about them um, on the other side of that coin is if you're making these very specialized and themed guitars, they're not going to sell to the masses. So if you've got, it's like if your name is Bill and somebody uh, that is a celebrity that you want their autograph and you go to buy one that says to Mary, that's probably not going to be as attractive to the one that's written out to your name. So anyway, if you're going to sell these things, in mass at a, a at a art fair or a cigar box guitar festival or something like that these one-of-a-kind things uh, may run the price up some and they may not appeal to everybody so just remember that and again i think i'm going to do uh, a, a little video in the future about theming i want to do a shout out uh, to my friend larry krieger who's down in Arizona. He sent me uh, some railroad date nails. Now, uh, like this one, the year I was born. I don't look that old, right? Anyway, uh, Larry Krieger is a railroad aficionado. I think he actually jumps on trains and rides them around. Uh, and while we're talking about that, Mark Nichols, I hope you're safe out there on your hobo tours. Uh, anyway, Larry, thanks so much for these nails. Um, I'm going to make a rack out of them or something. There's all kinds of different dates in here. But what they did with these nails was they, when they would change out ties, uh, railroad ties, which is funny, going back to my time in Montana in the summer of about my 20th year, I was on a tie gang for Burlington Northern driving railroad spikes by hand in the hardwood ties because the hydro spikers wouldn't do that. Anyway, we're getting way off out in the weeds here. Anyway. Uh, they would put a date nail in the tie when it was replaced. That way, when you're doing inspections later, you can see. So there's a lot of old tie nails in here. Um, but we're going to incorporate one of those nails into this build. So thanks again, Larry. Okay, who doesn't like airplanes? Um, I like airplanes. And in fact, one of my other hobbies is I actually hunt down airplane crash sites. Where I live... Uh, historically going back to the time of uh, wagons and stage coaches and, and things there's a pass out here that was historically difficult to cross uh, so you would be left trying to find a, a animal trail or something like that and and hauling anything into the Los Angeles basin from the north was very difficult um, if if you want to know more about this look up Beale's cut which was done about in the 1860s and it was a, a narrow uh, cut between a couple of uh, mountain formations anyway this New Hall Pass when commercial aviation started uh, uh, in earnest when a lot of people were flying 
historically there were a lot of airplane crashes because people were used to flying by sight. A lot of these air, airline pilots were World War I pilots. Uh, uh, things like instrument flying was just coming on and it was a treacherous place because they would come landing into Burbank Airport and they would be starting their descent in over the San, what's now the Santa Clarita Valley and they would get lost in fog and spin around and so there's a number of airplane crash sites around here. Now when I moved on to the property I live on, we bought this property, um, I had heard that it was a great place to look at the stars through a telescope and stuff so I did my Google search about uh, 14, 15 years ago, and I found a reference to my road and a plane crash site uh, that was visible from uh, the road I live on about a couple miles at a curve uh, down the highway that intersects with our road. And that's piqued my interest. So for the better part of two and a half years, I was trying to find this plane crash site. So I started looking in the archives of the Los Angeles Times and, and trying to figure out exactly where this uh, site was. Now, one time my daughter and I um, walked up uh, to the side of this hill and I thought it was up there. It struck me that it was a little too close to town or something. It would be further back in the mountains. But little did I know at that time, I was literally 70 or 75 feet from the crash site and the few remnants that are left. And then I went off to the next mountain range looking, and then by chance, uh, I saw a silhouette one morning that matched the, um, the, uh, the newspaper article uh, uh, photograph. So the moon was going down and I saw it and I thought, okay, so I ended up going back up there and found it. So uh, without getting into too much detail here, the plane was a Model 14H, uh, Lockheed Super Electra, which was a variant of Model 10, Model 12. The Model 12 was Amelia Earhart's plane, uh, but the 14H was a bigger plane uh, made by Lockheed, had a twin tail configuration, highly responsive. Anyway, the plane ended up being the Hudson Bomber of World War II. I want you to think about something here for a second. Um, the Wright brothers put a plane in the air for a few seconds and a few hundred feet in 1903, but yet by the 1930s, we progressed to the point where we were putting a number of people in planes and transporting them all over the place. And that's a huge uh, level of advancement in a very short time. When you think about, you're actually taking something off the ground and moving people regularly through a system of airlines. So the time frame we're talking about here is 1936, uh, 1937. Uh, they're making these decisions and um, what they decided to do was rather than focus on the airplane and associating it to the company, they put all of the branding about this airplane, uh, they gave a great deal of focus onto that and they ended up calling the plane the Sky Zephyr. All right, let's start here. The uh, Super Electra was a shiny plane. It had a finish almost like an Airstream camper. Um, uh, twin tail configuration. Um, and on the inside, uh, by today's standards, this was a very small plane, but it had lights, it had a luggage rack, um, stewardess. The uh, pressure uh, of the cabin could be uh, regulated on this plane and that was something new but anyway you had about 10 or 11 people could fit on this plane with a crew of three uh, compared to the DC-3 which is a bigger plane it would hold 32 passengers now if you look at, at this plane if you look at this picture very close right here you see that Z this is where they branded the plane and called it the Sky Zephyr North uh, West Airlines Sky Zephyr and they put a great deal of marketing into this plane to make it known as the Sky Zephyr. Uh, this is a picture uh, from a calendar of 1939 and this is going to become kind of ironic a little bit later in the story but uh, there was a great deal of effort given to making sure that everyone knew this plane was called the Zephyr, the Sky Zephyr. The Sky Zephyr came out uh, and hit the air 
in October 1937, um, Northwest Airlines ordered 11 of these planes and all of their stuff said Sky Zephyr, world's fastest transport, um, a million four hundred miles in Sky Zephyrs. Think about that today. Uh, sister ships of Howard Hughes Sky Zephyr. Yeah, this is the same plane that Howard Hughes uh, set the world record going around the world in uh, in 1938, uh, July 14, 1938. And here's actually a pin from the 1939 Chicago World's Fair um, that commemorates that. Northwest Airlines put a lot of effort into branding this in every way. You had matchbooks, uh, Sky Zephyr. Uh, they even had Wrigley Chewing Gum uh, make them gum, packet it up. Northwest Airlines, new Sky Zephyr, same picture. I uh, told you where it went. Um, Air Traveler's packet. Um, and so they put a lot of effort into this. Um, they handed out playing cards on the plane. Um, these cards here, there's a joker. Um, this variation uh, seems to be a little, little bit more rare, but uh, these cards were handed out to people on the plane. And then remember the old luggage tags everybody used to put on suitcases? Uh, Sky Zephyr, Northwest Airlines, Sky Zephyrs. They basically started off as a lot of airmail, an airmail contract for the United States of Postal Service, but there, there's a double tail Sky Zephyr on their airmail stickers, both printed on envelopes and uh, uh, um, stamps that you would put on. As the plane became more popular, and uh, uh, even throughout the world, you had Brazil putting out postage stamps showing the uh, 14h uh, super lecture there now all this stuff actually ended up being to the detriment of northwest airlines because almost immediately there start within months of these planes being in the air uh, there started to be crashes there was one in january 1938 at bozeman uh, the one closest to me was in may 1938 July 1938, another one in Billings. And then in 39, in January of 1939, uh, there was another crash in Miles City. And these, these crashes all ended up with nearly everybody on the plane uh, as a fatality. Uh, There's only one that didn't have everyone a fatality. So these planes, and this is, again, this is from 1939. By 1939, Northwest had said, we got to get off this plane. Now, even though this calendar shows the Sky Zephyr in 1939, well, people make calendars ahead of time. Uh, and so uh, this is nice, but in actuality, uh, I've got a couple of day sheets from um, Northwest Airlines going back uh, to 1939. And this was issued June 5th, 1939 for the week of June 15th. And when you start looking at the planes, there's one 14H, uh, there's DC-3s coming into the picture now, there, then there's the old smaller uh, Electra 10, uh, an Electra 10 there. But all the planes, there's a 14H left here and a 14H left here. DC-3s had coming in and taken, they started buying these up and replacing these. By October 1939, uh, November 1 for, for the schedule, there are no 14 H's left on the timetable. So um, they had taken these out of circulation. Now because Northwest Airlines branded this plane so heavily and because they had a really bad experience with it, all of this stuff is extremely rare. You think about uh, 9 or 10 people on a plane uh, eight planes in the air flying across uh, the western part of the United States each day making one trip. I mean, how many decks of cards could they hand out? And then almost into the first year of the plane being in the air, half of them crashed, leaving only four. So it got to the point where some people thought this plane was very dangerous. Now you want to remember Howard Hughes flew this plane around the world. The plane become 
almost the identical plane with a different nose section and a turret put in uh, was the very successful Hudson bomber of World War II. But this plane was just really quick and ultra responsive and mix that with people uh, flying by sight uh, and not by instruments. And, um, and it was kind of a recipe for disaster. Now this stuff here um, is very rare. These cards are some of the rarest cards in the world because uh, there's a round playing card that was issued by another airline that's fairly rare. But if you get, if you see these, they're ultra rare, um, especially if you start getting ace and joker cards. Um, the Sky Zephyr stuff shows up every once in a while on the internet. People are thinking this is from the 50s. Definitely not. This is from the period of October 1937 till June 1939. So you got about eight. 18 months where this actually happened. So this stuff is extremely rare and hard to run across. A little bit about the crash uh, site near me, about three miles away from me. Uh, what was happening is it was foggy. It was known to be foggy. And what uh, Northwest Airlines was doing was um, having people fly these planes into Las Vegas. They would take delivery there uh, and um, the reason they were doing that was because they didn't have to pay sales tax on the plane. These planes were costing $80,000, $90,000 back then fully rigged out. So that shows you what's happened with the value of our dollar since then. But anyway, they left Burbank Airport. Um, they came up through the Newhall Pass rather than trying to pass the San Gabriels. They came up, flew uh, northwest of LA, came through the Newhall Pass, and then followed a road called the Mint Canyon Road, which is now Sierra Highway. They got socked in about Agua Dulce, a little bit north of Agua Dulce, and started circling around. People were saying that they heard the plane, they saw the plane. Someone said that they heard a crash. Um, anyway, it took better part of two days to find uh, the wreck site. Um, and unfortunately, nine people lost their lives there. Um, I've been to the site. It's very hard to find, obviously, and I put a post up with the tail number of the plane, which is NC17394. So I built this guitar in memory of this plane and the people on the plane. And um, uh, let's go to the bench now and take a, take a look at uh, some of the details. All right, we've got most of this guitar built out. And we're going to take one last look at it before we put all the theming on it. And there's the bottom or the back side. All right, getting the neck off of this guitar is pretty easy. If I were to have the bolts on here, I would just uh, pull those out. Of course, as always with my guitars, they're really easy. I like to make guitars where I can access everything without taking the strings off. That's really why I started doing these uh, sound holes made out of these RV drains because the swing knot holds the bolt there. And then we simply open this up like this. I've got everything unbolted. The neck just pulls right out. Mm. All right, we'll get Tammy to sign it. Thank you, baby. All right, with that signed, uh, we've already got our holes uh, drilled for our tuners, and we are going to uh, put a coat of protectant. We're going to light sand uh, this just a tad here and there, and we're going to put a coat of protectant on here, uh, make it nice and shiny, and then we'll move on to the next step. All right, there we go. That neck really pops, too. That wood looks great with... A coat of lacquer on it. Okay, so our year was 1938, and I've got the 1938 nickel. What's interesting about this nickel is uh, they started switching to the Jefferson nickel that we're familiar with, the Jefferson head nickel, in 1938. Most of the mints, all except the Denver mint. So uh, this nickel came out of the Denver mint in 1938. Now I want you to notice where I put this nickel is right in the center of the 12th fret. So when somebody's playing this and they're, they bring their hand down their side, they automatically know from that nickel being indented in there where the 12th fret is. In blues, 12th and 14th fret are the biggies. 
So I, I drilled a little pilot hole here, then I used a 5 8 Forstner bit. Uh, make a note of that in your book. Uh, they sit uh, a nickel perfectly and some piezos as well. Anyway, I cut this in here a little bit deeper than nickel, the depth of the thickness of the nickel. And then I'm taking this wood colored epoxy, two part epoxy, and I'm putting it in the part that I've cut out and I'm going to spread this out evenly and then I'm going to pop the nickel in there. I've got the epoxy in there. And you want to remember this wood epoxy? It's a JB weld. We all know what that is. Um, it's the wood version. It dries up to look like wood. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that nickel and I'm just going to drop it in there just like so. And around the edges you're going to see the epoxy come out like so. I'm simply going to wipe off the excess like that. And then we can take some really light sandpaper when it's done and touch up any excess that's there like that. Now, while this is still wet, I can always take a tad bit of lacquer thinner on a rag like this or a cloth and go around the edge like so and clean up any excess epoxy. So there we go. There's our 1938 nickel embedded in the neck right under the 12th fret. Uh, and it will be good to go in a couple of hours. I can go around the edges if I need to and touch this up with some really light sandpaper. And then I'll just give it another blast of lacquer and we'll be done with this part. Then I'll put the tuners on and flip it over and do some work on the other side. I almost forgot, uh, before I can put the tuners on, on the back, like so, yeah, these tuners, everything is silver, shiny plain, shiny everything on, on this guitar. But before I can put these on the, the back, I forgot, I got to put these retainers right here. And before I can do that, I need to put the graphic uh, on the headstock. You remember the playing cards? Again, these are really rare. If you see them, scoop them up. Um, I do have a collection of them. I've had a harder time running across this color than these. Uh, anyway, I have a Joker. Um, the Joker card. And I, using a scanner, I digitized this card and made uh, the headstock graphic. So I'm going to uh, put that on there. There is a video I did called uh, Graphics. You want to watch that. It goes into, into detail about how I size these, digitize them on the computer, scan them. Anyway, I'm going to put this on here. And then uh, once I get it uh, affixed and a couple coats of uh, my Mod Podge on this, then I'll start cutting out for uh, the retainers and then I can flip it over and put on my tuners. Now you all know, uh, any of you that saw my grounding the strings video, we know about the tension pins, we know about the copper tape, uh, we know about the ball canning lids, and we know how to take an awl, put, build a cover out of, uh, by cutting a lid, putting it over the tension pins, doing one side first, poking uh, or running a small drill bit through here and then taking it out all and popping those down. Um, on this guitar, because the skin of the, the plane was, uh, for lack of a better comparison, kind of like an, uh, an Airstream camper, it was shiny like that. I cut this out of a, a cookie tin, believe it or not, a Christmas cookie tin. So when you turn this over, you're going to see that. But I'm going to put this plate on here and run the screws in. And then, of course, I'll take a drill from the other side and run it up through like we usually do. All right, there we go. Screws are in. I'll turn this over and do my drill and then I'll pop these in and then we'll work the top. 
drill the holes with a small bit from the top side down uh, resulting in that take my all one two three and there we go that's in there pretty good that's where my string keepers will be on the bottom and on the top same thing we've got airplane with shiny I'm going to use a shiny a piece off of a cookie tin instead of the ball canning lid uh, that's part of the theme we're going to put that on there but before we do that I'm going to cut of this piece of this uh, sticky back copper tape you want to remember we got to ground the strings and when we stick this on here that will do it for us okay there we go we're going to peel off the backing now this stuff is really sticky so what you want to do is you want to put this like that and then peel it back like this trust me on that if you try to take it all off at once it's going to be a problem and then i'm going to take a scissors or something as i pull it back here i'm going to take this and push it down into my drop down like that and then like so and then pull it in like this this is on the inside of the guitar here so that's not really critical um, that it's pretty this part will be hid and then i just take my all i can see where my holes are there i just put it there uh, there and then for my string holes i'm just gonna do that just like always and then this piece that's left over i'm gonna put it right here like so and on the inside it will go up the side and then i'll ground my wire from the bottom of the coil pot volume pot to a little piece of metal right there and we're good to go now i can put this on top drill my holes from underneath and punch them in with the awl All right, there it is. Holes in the top of the tailpiece cover. Shiny airplane, shiny tailpiece cover. Now the top of the box and the back of the box, I have for the graphic, I am going to use uh, the front of the playing card. I scanned one of these, digitized it, and then use my template to make it the top of this box so this is what the top of the box is going to look like now i'm going to put a base coat the matte mod podge again one more time there is a video i did about graphics it goes into detail about that click on the eye on the upper right of your screen there you'll see the eye and it, it will give you a link to that anywhere i'm going to take all this off and i'm going to coat this I'll put this on, do a couple of top coats, and then I'll cut everything out uh, with a razor knife like this one. Okay, I've got everything stripped off the box, took it off the hinges. I'm going to flip this over on this piece of uh, wood here and here. And then, again, one of these playing card graphics is going to go on the top. I'll show you what that looks like when it's all done. Okay, guys, there's the code of Matt Mod Podge. Now, I want to remind you that these holes right here go to this. That makes this up. These are the holes for the bolts that go through and go to the sink drains in the sound holes that hold everything close. So you always want to make sure that you know where you're at, especially when your stuff is upside down. But I know because these holes are here that uh, this is going to go this way up like so there we go now i'm going to put a roller on that roll it out let it dry put a couple of top coats on it and then i'll cut my holes in there and that'll be it on, on the bottom of the box same thing on the top we just put a coat on here i want to get around these holes we don't want them to be full of Mod Podge because we're going to have to poke holes in and know the size they need to be. Um, 
but as in that video on doing graphics you don't need to cut all this out right now you just line it up where it needs to be like so there we go we'll let that dry we'll put two coats on top then we'll come around from the back and cut all these out with a razor knife so let's leave that alone for right now all right back to my friend larry krieger and his railroad tie nails i've got this 1938 nail uh which is the year of this plane we're talking about and back to all the uh, connection between the zephyr trains and the zephyr plane uh, the last thing I'm going to do on this guitar is finish cutting through uh, this tie, dated tie nail, and then we are going to put it on the tail piece of the guitar. There we go. All right. Took the Forstner bit and made that. Now we took equal parts of this and this uh, and we used the wood colored epoxy, same one we used to put the nickel in the neck. Now we're going to put this in the part that we've cut out for the railroad marker nail like so. Remember it cleans up with Lacquer thinner. Then this will drop in right there. And There we go, final touch. Thanks again, Larry Krieger. So here it is done. Um, I didn't matchbook the neck. There's the card. 1938 nickel. The playing card. And thank you, Larry Krieger. The anniversary of this crash is coming up on May 16th. Uh, 2018 it'll be the 80th anniversary the watch has stopped at 207 so if you can find this site I will definitely be up there at that time in memory of the people on the plane all right I'm going to send this guitar out with an artist in about a week um, who knows you might see it show up somewhere um, I'm glad I got this video done this is kind of a sentimental issue to me and um, thanks for watching mm -hmm.